So time to let's get started. Very welcome to this presentation called DDD Really Matters. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It has been such a nice time for me here in Sydney. I'm from Sweden, but I'll do my best to speak something like English, so you will understand. I will actually use some uh, German and Swedish too during this talk. We'll see how that goes. So I'm Jimmy, Jimmy Nilsson, and uh, I've been a developer for quite some time, 30 years now. Uh, how many of you are developers in here? Architects, project managers, testers, um, and uh, the rest of you are hybrids. I, I love the hybrids most, actually. That, that's the thing. I, I wanted to check who I'm going to offend during this presentation, so now I know. I'm, I'm um, feeling quite okay, most developers. I will offend you the most, by the way. So a long time ago, I used to be um, a, an agilist, a developer, as I said, and a DDDer. I still am. I still feel that I'm more that today than ever before. And I will, I will uh, try to become even more. I love to learn and become better over time. So uh, with that out of the way, let's get started. The idea about this presentation is to talk about a couple of ideas for how you can achieve success in your pro projects so uh, your client's business will uh, really elevate, or your own business, by the way. But first, a couple of observations. I've captured uh, loads of those. I have four I'd like to tell you, see if you recognize those situations at all. The first uh, observation or situation I was invited to a workshop a couple of years ago, an evening workshop. They asked me to come and talk to a couple of uh, really hardcore security specialists, military grade specialists on security. And they wanted me to talk about how we in the DDD field start up new projects and yeah, how developers think about this uh, overall. And I started to tell them a few thoughts on that. And they got totally shocked. They thought I was so unresponsible to not start the whole initiative by doing a, a full security assessment and an information analysis from a security perspective. And I was as shocked as them. It's really weird for me to start there. We kind of, nothing was decided. We didn't know where to go. How, how can I start from that angle? So we had a really... Well, it ended well, I think. We had a nice evening, but uh, I guess they still kind of hate me <laughs> because uh, I, I was thinking so strange. To me, that sounds a little bit like starting out this new initiative, talking about how thick shall the door be. But who talked about the door at all? It might not even be a house. Where maybe it was a bike. So it, it's kind of uh, starting, in, starting a bit wrong, I think. Second example. This is top level management. We haven't uh, decided on anything yet, but there is going to be an initiative starting up real soon, new project. The CIO, for example, he's out the, in the town shopping, shopping from the shelf. He want to have stuff. So a workflow package, everybody want to have that, he says, or, or needs. Of course, we're going to buy that. Again, how on earth can we know that before anything has been decided? It's too early. Another thing that could be bought, of course, might be a humongous agile process or tool for uh, being really agile. That, that would be a perfect another example. Have you seen any of that ever? Uh, a few nods, thank you. You're so nice. That's why I love Sydney. In Sweden, people would not agree with me at all. So the third observation, this is the uh, really, again, hardcore guy. And this time, uh, she works for the uh, operations department. And uh, just to be nice, I walk over there to talk a little bit and say, well, do you know what? We are thinking about a new initiative. That pisses her off. Why am I the last one to hear about this, she says. We have to order stuff. We have to decide on protocols and uh, SLAs and yada, yada, yada. And oh, 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 it's a bit early, I say again. Uh, nothing has been 
I really started up. We can't, I don't know any of those answers. And she kind of relaxed when I say I will come to her first of everything. She, she will get the, all the detailed information, information first. And finally, this guy is a hardcore project manager arriving to uh, the environment of a client of mine. Spending months of creating this perfect document tree with loads of documents in it. Surprisingly enough, when I go in and have a look at all the documents, they are empty. They only have headers because they are just templates. But it's really beautiful. Nothing has been started, nothing has been decided, but we have this document tree. Don't you feel good? That was the project manager uh, offense, sorry. I'm, ooh, I'm done with that, good. Do you see I'm moving over here? <laughs> so uh, I'm not saying that developers are better. We are doing this all the time as well, I think. So uh, I guess most of you, including me, would find it to be really fun to talk about a new UI framework for creating Twitter scale day one when we are creating a, a little application for the sailing club, maybe. You never know, you never know. Or another uh, solution or new database product coming out which will actually make the cap theorem go away. Wouldn't that be super cool? Or make services start so fast it's actually negative time. Well, and and we, can, we can get going in lots of directions here. So I think we are very much the same. But I think all those examples were about being wrong in different ways. It was a lot of focusing on speciality and doing it in kind of in vacuum. That's not the way to start, I think. It will be like this. It will be like doing a lot of activities, keeping busy instead of getting anywhere. So it's like being, it's about busyness instead of business. It's similar to having an exercise bike at home. It's quite neat. It's quite easy to measure your progress. It won't rain, no wind, no elevation, but you are not getting anywhere, are you? So it's very similar. So, as a developer, I hate problems. Let's focus on solutions instead. Isn't that how we are? Yeah, I'm uh, kissing up a little bit here now. So, let's see what we can do about this. Because I think we had a mindset problem and, and some kind of gap here. We need to bridge that gap. So how can we create great togetherness to succeed? I think that's the question, because together we are strong and we can do anything and we can fulfill the business needs and more. So I have five different ideas. Let's see if you agree with any of those. Maybe you have others that we can talk about afterwards, but for now, I will I'd like to start with the first one. And that is about where to start. I hope this movie isn't too old now for the audience. Do you recognize it? Yeah. Some of you do, thank you. What is it? Holy Grail, Monty Python, yes. So this story is actually about uh, an interview with John Cleese quite many years ago. He talked about this uh, when they created this movie. And uh, he... For, uh, one, as one of the parts of that interview, he said that, well, we had um, a tricky scene when doing the movie. We were shooting it over and over and over again, but it didn't work out. It wasn't, ah, we didn't feel well. It wasn't really fun. We, we didn't like it. So we just let go of that scene for a moment, went to the drawing table, think a little bit about it, and came up with a new idea. We, we tried that new ID immediately. At first try, it was bam, great. We felt really good, it was fun. We went home, took the evening off. A couple of days later, it was time to have a look at the full movie. So they sit uh, together, the whole team of Monty Python, looking at it. And yeah, it, most of it was very good. And 
but all of a sudden they come to this scene. And again, it's not funny. It's actually the opposite. They, they feel bad, they almost get depressed. They, they can't have that, uh, such a scene in a comedy, of course not. And then they realize, actually, this is not the, the, the good version. This, this is an, another one of the bad versions. So they ask the editor, uh, what happened here? This is not what we decided on to use. And the editor said, no, uh, you, you, you're totally right. This is uh, one of the prior versions. But the version you wanted to use, it was spoiled. And uh, John asked, uh, oh, too bad. Could we have a look at it? And uh, the editor showed them the scene. And they were laughing like crazy, crying out of joy. And it was super fun. And then they thought, well, what was the problem? And the editor gets a little bit uh, upset. Didn't you see it? Let me show you here on slow motion. Look at this frame now. There's a shadow in the very, very far down corner, probably the shadow of a knee in front of the camera. And the moral of the story is that the editor didn't want the movie to, to be used in the whole world. All editors would laugh at him for not being a superb editor. But that doesn't really matter. What matters with the comedy? It has to be funny, of course. So you can guess which scene they decided to use. That's the importance. So what to start with? I'm going on a trip here. Shall I pick the boat, the plane, or the car? Well, that's, that's a bit hard to answer. Maybe I'm going to a trip to the neighbor for a glass of wine. Probably don't need any of those. Or maybe I'm going to Mars. Probably bad alternatives again. So of course, I, I should start with the purpose. That's my starting point. The purpose is the first step of bridging the gap. We are starting to create a little bridge here. So by having using the same purpose, we can probably get into the same mindset and starting to collaborate together in a, in a good way. When you get back home at Monday, start talking to your colleagues and um, tell them we should start with purpose. They might tell you, that sounds good. What's our purpose? And to be honest, not that many companies have actually a clear picture of this. Maybe your have, I don't know that. But I find it over and over again when I talk to the management of my clients, they have actually not thought too much about that. It's kind of just going on not, n without thinking too much about purpose. Other of your colleagues might say, that's a stupid question. The purpose is to make money. And uh, I don't think I'm saying here at all that the purpose should stop you from making money. It's quite boring purpose. I'm only in it for the money. Oh, God. <sighs> yeah. We need to have money to get food on the table, of course. But I think it helps us to find another purpose what, with what we are doing. For example, some of you are maybe working with my favorite example, curing cancer then you will jump out of joy every morning from bed and it's fun to go to work. You will still get money, you pay, you payments, of course. But that's more like a side effect. And the really strange thing is that when companies start focusing much more on the purpose instead of just making money, all of a sudden they start making more money. So it's not a conflict here, not at all. On the opposite. Thirty years ago, in Sweden, it was mandatory to do military services. So uh, I had the choice of uh, do it or go to jail. And I thought about it for a long time. And, <laughs> and I decided to do military services. It, it actually appeared to me to be worse than I would ever have expected. So people uh, were screaming at me all the time, calling me names and things, and spitting at me. and. Uh, horrible and I hated it 
five years ago, something like that, I read up on military theory, and I, I was totally shocked. 150 years ago, they knew how to do microservices in a good way. Isn't that amazing? So all of a sudden, I can kind of uh, forgave my old uh, officers when I did my services. That all they wanted me to do was learn how to become a microservice, a really efficient one. I didn't realize, but now I do. So um, what, what it takes, for example, to be uh, doing warfare in, in, uh, in that style, you have to align on purpose. Because if you don't align on purpose, you can't have autonomy either. Every little team without a strong purpose, they will just run around. Well, let, what do you say? Shall we take that? Uh, we take that house and uh, we do. Uh, we actually skip houses. And it, it will be a mess. And the same with microservices, for example, of course. We, we need to have strong alignment on purpose. Then we can have autonomy. So, okay, you didn't uh, give too many protests about purpose being a, a fad or something like that. So, we have decided on that. But that's not enough, enough with our bridge. We have constructed a bridge that was very fragile. Maybe I could uh, go over there once or twice, but carrying a bag would not do it. It would break down. and, and, and when there is bad weather, it would also be troublesome, and so on. So we have to continue here. And actually working, we have to work on that bridge for, for it to really help us out, uh, bridging the gap and solving the mindset problems. So the second thought is, what is the context? If you have been uh, doing domain-driven design, how many of you have tried this at all? Wow. When I did that, ask that question 10 years ago, I, I had to look for my friend if he was in the room. Nowadays, it's more than half. That's wow, what has happened? Amazing. If you are into the field of domain-driven design, you don't think this is a hard question, actually, because you totally realize, well, the overall context is the domain or the business. It comes natural. W what should it be otherwise? But when we started talking or uh, describing those observations, they kind of had forgotten their, uh, their context. They were into their speciality fields, forgetting about their, uh, that they need needed to help out with the business and to create outcomes. That wasn't at all what they were talking about was more about protecting their reputation or some, something like that. So the business is the overall context. So we are now about to do an ama amazing um, uh, achievement here. And uh, this is not a can of beer. This is uh, me holding onto a sun blocker. Uh, I have this sensitive skin, so those lamps Tonight, I will be red like, uh, like the hat. Uh, <coughs> so you are setting out for a, a really interesting trip. Then there is always someone that will tell you the most important is that you carry some blocker. Well, kind of, it's kind of, I, I would say it's necessary at some point in time, but it's not sufficient. It won't take me anywhere at all. So. I think of this very much about uh, business development as well. Shall you be offensive or defensive when it comes to soccer, for example? You could play the game like this, the whole team at the very back. It might be a good idea from time to time, but you will rarely win any games. But I'm not saying either that you should all should go on offense. That would also mean that we, you would lose, of course. So we need to have some kind of uh, balance here. It's just that I often find that when people have a choice, they kind of pick uh, defensive, the defensive side. And in business development, that would mean that, well, we are not going to do any investments at all until we have compliance in perfect shape. Have you heard that at your places? 
not a lot is going to happen for three years, but we are fulfilling upcoming compliance rules that might happen, things like that. So it's a lot about also uh, being uh, defensive when it comes to business development. I it's about cutting costs, thinking about along those lines. I find it personally at least more fun to focus on the offensive side. It, that, then it's much more about growing the market and finding new markets. It's very much about revenue focus. It might sound that I'm just thinking about wasting money. That's not my point here. But if you can get your revenue to skyrocket, it doesn't matter too much what cost you had. The effect might be tremendous on the on revenue side. So maybe it's a little bit about being driven by fear or being driven by excitement and want to improve and evolve. But it's actually not my point here to say that we should all go for the offensive. We, we need both sides, absolutely. So coming back to the outcome, we can organize for that to happen instead of only activities. I have two different uh, uh, examples of organizations. The first one is uh, kind of I guess this is a classic organization. We have a couple of different uh, specialized departments. So when it's time to create a certain outcome, it kind of starts maybe with the marketing department thinking and doing stuff. And when they are done, they kind of toss over their result to the next department over the fence. The next department might be the construction department. They get it from marketing and they start constructing do the same, work with it for a while, toss it over to the next department, which is the developers, toss it to the testers, something like that. That might be an example. The problem with that kind of organization is, there are several, uh, I think, that uh, all those arrows means friction between those departments. Oh, we, we got this uh, bad stuff from them, and oh, they are horrible, and oh, we, we hate them, and Things like that is always happening. It's also the case that each of those departments have their own budget, and they will automatically start, start doing local optimizations because they are measured at certain things. For example, a typical IT department might be measured on number of open trouble reports, tickets. What will happen? Well, a user really wants to, uh, needs to have, uh, get help with something. Uh, the ticket arrives at the IT department and they say, well, here on page 11, you haven't filled in that information. Please have it back. No open ticket. You see, I achieved my goal. Easy. But it didn't help the whole picture. It only helped my local optimization. It's also the case that the marketing is quite far away from the outcome and the customers in that case, which is also a bit bad, typically. You need to have very close contact. So an alternative could be like this. Instead of having uh, specialized departments, you create two different departments having all different skills at each of them. And th then we get away of a lot of friction. I think we are, it's much easier for us to get uh, well, we are closer to the market than the customers, of course, and it goes faster, typically. Uh, some might react on this. Quite many developers at first dislike this. They want to hang out with their peers, not the sales guy, for Christ's sake. That could it be worse? <laughs> sales people and, oh, oh my God. But I think actually, Ironically, this is a good way of becoming better as a developer also. And you can still hang out with your peers. It's not just the first priority. First priority is the outcome, and then you will do other stuff as well, of course. This, when this uh, really works out, uh, sorry, this has a tendency of really working out until someone has a look at it and, and see something. Oh my God, there's duplication here. It might be the CFO, for example. You are doing the same thing there and there. Oh, that sounds expensive, he says. Let's not have that. And all of a sudden you go back to the other kind of organization. 
What is really strange, I've actually asked a couple of those guys, what, how would you do if you have like a crisis situation? How would you organize for that? And then they say, well, that's actually quite easy. We just take everybody we need, put them in the same room, lock the door until they fix the problem. And it's solved like that. So they kind of have it in them. But then they start thinking about saving money again and everything goes wacko. Or might do at least. Anyone c being a CFO? Uh, should have checked that before. Okay, so as a developer, we are typically thinking quite a lot about the code, I would say. Managers, we might ha often have the notion that they only care about money. And uh, well, we, we have kind of a cert certain gap here once again. But uh, I think this model I'm going to tell you now might actually help to bridge the gap. Maybe you have heard that all models are wrong, but some are useful. This model is certainly wrong. You can tear it down in 10 seconds. But it's still useful because the managers will start behaving in the right direction. So the model is uh, saying that actually code and money is kind of like the same thing. For one thing, you create code uh, to create value, and value is measured in money, you see? Kind of correlates well. I always talk about the maintenance cost being higher if you have a lot of code. So a, a very easy model might be to say, one line of code, it will cost you one dollar a year in maintenance. And again, now you start thinking, ah, maybe I should write very long lines and, and things like that. I know, I know it breaks down immediately, but at the same time, I think you would agree that it is easier to maintain something that is 10,000 lines of code compared to one million. Would you agree? You, can, you get that feeling, yeah, 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 that's true. So it's in the big numbers. What happens when you tell managers about this model, they become super happy. All of a sudden they realize why you developers are whining all the time about the code and that you want, want it to be nice and small and everything. They had never understood that before. To them, you were just whining. Now they kind of connect it and they get happy. So I actually, I think they, they like this model more than the de developers, actually. Anyway, now the managers start behaving in the right direction. Oh, maybe we shouldn't just add code like crazy and copy paste and that, that's not a good idea. Maybe we, because that will cost us next year and 10 years from now, that the cost will be crazy. And they start thinking like that. Will you believe me? Try it and see what happens. I've seen it. Because the reason I mentioned this specific model is that I think actually size matters a lot when it comes to code bases. Because the size of the code base, as I said, the size drive cost. But it also drives bugs. That's also very intuitive to us. A very large code base typically have more bugs and it's harder to make a change to it compared to a small one. And it goes slower to move around. You have more code to browse. Uh, it's hard to know it all and things like that. All of a sudden, someone will tell you, you have to increase the team size. That's the solution. Project manager, sorry, but quite often <laughs> that comment comes from you. And what happens now? More code. Exactly. So sooner or later it will look like this. We actually started a vicious circle. Adding code, adding people, people will add code, adding code will add, uh, vicious circle fast. I'm very hesitant to add people to delayed projects. There is actually a book describing a formula. How much more delayed will you be when you add one person to a delayed project? That book was written 40 years ago. Nobody seemed to have read it. It's really strange, mystical man month. Just try out the formula and you will see that the project will never end. So this piece of code here, it was not created by three developers, as you might imagine. 
And uh, it's actually not uh, a dependency diagram for classes. It's actually a dependency diagram for assemblies. And now it gets really scary. But do you see? <laughs> oh my god. Whew. The, the, the situation when um, for this uh, code base was that I think there were like 25 developers. They worked really hard, really fast. Nothing came out. So the product owner was, yeah, he, he was uh, so uh, irritated and uh, it was becoming a real problem. I'm not saying I haven't been involved in such projects, creating it as well. I, I probably have. I kind of forget some such things though. Okay, next thing, how shall we work? We are continuing uh, with our little bridge. It's still uh, not very easy to walk over it. We have to do much more work. So we are kind of um, creating, I don't know what that's called in English, but we are making it stronger when we are putting more weight uh, in a couple of minutes on it. So I quite often tell pe people, uh, typically developers, well, why don't you just walk over to the managers and talk a little bit to them? That's not dangerous. And they never, they never go over that bridge. They kind of find thousand excuses. It's not that easy. We have to make, we have to do more work on the bridge before it, we can use it. Not probably I would also find excuses and I wouldn't go over it either. After all, I'm quite heavy nowadays. So I need more, a better bridge. So the third idea is to focus on language. Again, this is so natural for domain-driven design people because there is, we talk a lot about the domain, sorry, the ubiquitous language all the time. How we shall create a, a language to share between um, everything we do and well, it should be in the code and when we talk and things like that. I have a little story that uh, uh, I'd like to tell you regarding this. I went to uh, Austria a couple of years ago to ski with my family in Kitzbühel. Have you heard about Kitzbühel here in Australia? Uh, I should have come up with a better story, but <laughs> maybe let's assume, I'm, let's assume I'm in the lift for having a surfboard or something like that. I, if that, no. Sorry, I was standing in the ski lift uh, together my wife, my wife here, my youngest son here. Three of us in a four-seater. We had like two minutes until it was our time. And all of a sudden, there is a very small boy ski skiing over to us. He's like this, standing next to my wife. And uh, my wife finds that to be quite uh, not so good because he hears his ski teacher scream at him. And she starts to think, oh my god, they, they might think we are trying to kidnap this boy. And that's not a good idea in Sweden, certainly not in Austria, uh, so if you're Swede. So she wa oh, uh, she starts to do like this, uh, I mean, <laughs> and, and uh, his ski teacher screams in German for him, uh, Achtung, Achtung, bleib in der Gruppe, which kind of means uh, stay with the group. And he uh, screams back in German. I don't know German, so I, I can't do it. But uh, he kind of screams something. Maybe he was uh, saying something bad or not. I don't know. But then he turns to us and says, Jag vill åka med er. Oh, that, and that's Swedish. That means I want to go with you. And he spoke Swedish. And what actually happened there, he, he, we let him go. Although my wife uh, still didn't think that was a good idea, but we let him uh, go with us because uh, at the top of the hill, uh, yeah, the ski teacher would come just 30 seconds afterwards, so we couldn't get that far with him. So, um, uh, and he tells us, I spend all my summers in Sweden and yada yada. He talked like the whole trip, uh, like uh, crazy, and uh, uh, I. I think what happened was that he heard us speak uh, in that area of the ski lift and we spoke Swedish and just because of that single thing he liked us. Isn't that almost too powerful? We could definitely kidnap him. <laughs> I, I, no problem, he would never understand that happened actually. He, he would just have loved it. And, 
So, what does that have to do with our job as developers? You might think. How many of you have uh, wanted to talk very much with your domain experts, but they seem to have too little time for you? Has that ever happened to you? Kind of many, yeah. Uh, when I hear that, I always get a little bit suspicious. There could be, perhaps there are more reasons, but at least two common reasons for that situation. The first reason might be the domain expert don't think what you're doing is important, and what then you should just leave. You can't possibly succeed, I would say, if they don't want to spend time with you. A domain expert is extremely important if you believe in domain-driven design because they bring all the depth knowledge that you really need to create something amazing. You need to be able to spend a lot of time with them. The other reason is that you are, excuse me for saying this, but you are boring them. They find you so boring because you can't get into their room before you say repositories and side effect free functions and uh, oh, they find that to be, oh my God. It, it takes one of those words and they get this blank face. Have you seen it? Blank face, oh, I'm busy, please leave. And then we'll not ask you to come the next day. You, you can be so sure about that. But thankfully, this works for us as well. As long as we know about it, think a little bit about it. So if we go there and try to share their language, talk their language the best we can and listen to them, the opposite will happen. They will lock the door and not let you out because you are such a nice person. They, they want to talk to you. They want to hang out with you. When you go to the pub in the evening, you find that the main expert is kind of with you all the time. That's almost a little bit scary. <laughs> but on the other hand, those domain experts, they are so rare. The domain expert isn't a guy who who know this old system or something like that. The domain expert is one of the best in the world in, in his field or her field. And he doesn't only know how to do the job, he would also do know how to build a machine to do the job, kind of on a meta level. So since they are so rare, it only makes it even more important to take care of them. And when you do that, something amazing will happen. You will find out that over time, this is such a nice situation to be in. The energy will flow and you will have such a good time. And all of a sudden the results are coming also. You will do really good stuff. And one of those things we you are going to do is to evolve that, that ubiquitous language. It's very much about understanding in both directions. And evolving the ubiquitous language is not about just listening and collect words. It's also about tell them that when you think they are actually, now you are using two words for the same thing, could we stop doing that and only pick one of them? And they will tell us when we speak the ubiquitous language when we don't make sense. And typically that means there is actually some bug here going around. We have misunderstood something. They will snap that immediately if you let them have the chance of hearing your ideas about the solution. So, software is magic. I think it's the best building material in the world because unlike bricks, for example, when we, we have tried to build something with in software by just adding words next to each other, if it's not doing what we want, then we just press Control Z or Backspace and whoop, we're back to zero. Tell that to a brickman or what, what's it called? Or a carpenter or anything like that. They would be so envy on you. They want to have that, of course. So software is magic. You, we construct our programs by just adding words. And if we wanted to do something else, we just change a word. Very simple, very soft. Unfortunately, this is not how most software is. Most software is like this. This shows how the cost for making a change to a piece of software increase over time. And this is the law of nature to most people. Maybe not to you, but most people out there. They will kind of say, well, you know how software is. 
Uh, well, it's really weird. Soft, that's how hardware is. That we are creating with our software efforts situations that are harder to change than hardware nowadays. And this is not what we want, of course. We want to have a curve looking more like this. It's obvious everybody wants it. Because uh, if uh, business people have know they have a, a, a software situation of this more flattened curve, they know they can try out their IDs, and another ID, another ID. Sooner or later, it takes off. They have more than one chance. In the first curve, they had one chance. And it might work, probably not, because it often takes many tries before you, you really reach success. So how do you re uh, reach the second curve? You know? Well, actually, all of you know. Just say one thing you like, and it will be correct. Not the one thing, one thing. <laughs> Someone said uh, DDD. Good choice. That's why, <laughs> actually, it, it, everything is needed here. It's having the best people. Uh, um, TDD, for example. Yeah. Lots of things. Everything you're using and then you find to be useful. It, there is no silver bullet. It takes it all. So we have talked about how important it is to talk that ubiquitous language. I think we can take it even further. Because we are still in the risk of uh, not creating the best collaboration environment with the domain experts when we are talking to them. And then we say, please leave. Now it's time for uh, Visual Studio. And, and they have to leave. And we, we could instead create um, an environment where we actually program in the ubiquitous language as well, if we'd like to. This might sound totally crazy to you. But I've been spending quite a lot of time on doing this uh, yeah, the last 10 years with uh, mixed success, I would say. Anyway, there was a paper written 25 years ago called Language Oriented Programming, which is very much about this. So instead of solving all problems with your uh, general purpose language, such as Java or C Sharp, you, you will, for certain parts of your solutions, it might, might make a lot of sense to create a language that the domain expert and you and you can uh, share, and not just talk the language, program in the language as well. And that takes the collaboration to the next level. Have you anyone tried this? Ah, so, so good. You have something to look forward to, not just the next uh, version of a framework. This is really what matters, I think. Okay, fourth idea, how to direct energy. I call this use the circle of safety. And so our bridge is becoming better. And this is actually useful now. This is what I was aiming for. Uh, we have a really good bridge here so by using this fourth uh, ID. And this ID is uh, something like this. If you are starting out a new initiative, especially at a big company, something is going to start. I call it the immune system of the company. You, a couple of you, you have got, uh, got together and started out, we have a new idea. The rest of the company will come and try to kill you. <laughs> that happens all the time. It's, a, it's just automatic. Not by evilness. I don't know what it is, but uh, I, I'm sure it's not by evilness. But the kind of the, the status quo is wanted for some reason. So if you're going to do that, you really have to take care and put up some protection around you. Typically, you should be uh, in stealth mode, moving to another location. But if you can't, at least try to really put up high borders to, to uh, be able to deal with this. So good neighbors need good fences, it said. Again, maybe you see connection here to domain-driven design and bounded context, having borders to to uh, make it po more possible and easy to collaborate in a good way, or microservices for that sake. So uh, that's one thing, protecting uh, to threats at the outside. But we are also our own worst enemies as 
uh, humans. Because in the past, uh, a, a strange sound that meant threat of life a couple of years ago, many years ago. So those of you sitting here, all your an ancestors, they were very afraid people. A dangerous sound, scoop, leave, go away, probably a lion. Unfortunately, that is kind of uh, working in the wrong direction nowadays. So um, it's rare we have threats to our life every day. But our brains believe so. So when you get to the office, your boss is coming in through the door, and he's not smiling. And what happens then is that your brain automatically tries to understand this, and it goes to the very, very, very negative side. It must be something bad. He didn't smile. Probably he didn't want to kill me, but... Tomorrow, he comes again. He doesn't say hi. Now you are sure he's going to kill you. <laughs> and just because of not being very careful to smile and say hi to your colleagues, in that circle that you have created, all of a sudden, all the energy is now used for your internal stuff. Everybody are afraid and stressed and uh, things like that. You have no power to reach out and do what you are supposed to and create outcomes. I have a, a very basic tip here. Let's see if it's useful for you. So let's assume I tell, uh, I tell you uh, in a meeting. We are, are having a business meeting, 10 people. And I say, I can see you're watching your phone. And then I continue talking about something. That person probably felt a bit, whoa, what's up with Jimmy? He's, uh, will he kill me? And uh, that, that did, didn't uh, work out very well for you. Not the rest of the group either. They thought, well, what is going on? They don't hear what I'm saying any longer. They are thinking about, strange. He's normally quite smooth. Yeah. But if I take care and communicate in a better way, I can use this tip. I could say, I can see that you are watching your phone today. That makes me think that you might don't want to be in my project. And that makes me really sad because I know you, I really want you. Did you hear? Not too threatening any longer. Was the second version better? Yes. He said yes. Yep. So I think this quite often works out. Unfortunately, I have a tendency of forgetting about this. Uh, but uh, when uh, something goes really bad, I, I can, whoa, maybe I should try this out. So providing that the information to your colleague in four different dimensions might help a lot. Takes a little bit longer. On the other hand, you will save hours of uh, energy loss. So it's worth it, I would say. Communication is really tricky. A couple of years ago, I, I used to work at the university many years ago. I, one of my old students came to me um, afterwards and said, I have solved the problem of outsourcing. And he was really, ah, Nirvana. I have solved it all. And then he said, except for one thing, we still have this communication problem. And I thought that was such a, a wonderful story. And uh, I, I have to see if I can find him and ask him if he still believes that was a good idea. <laughs> so, also regarding that circle of safety should mean that you should feel safe to make mistakes. I went to a big uh, car manufacturer in Sweden uh, many years ago to discuss a new product. And I was very proud and told them, actually, I think I have the world record in mistakes. They were not impressed. They kind of kicked me out the door immediately because they never did mistakes at that company. And to me, that was a bit puzzling to me. I thought, uh, isn't that how you learn? Uh, so uh, another friend of mine, he runs a museum called the Museum of Failures. Is, do you have that here? It's touring around the world nowadays. Ironically, this is a big success, this uh, failure museum. I think that's really funny. So uh, they are showing stuff that didn't work out. For example, one of the pictures here are showing fat-free Pringle. I could have tell th told them in, in advance. That wouldn't be a good idea. And other things here. But 
why not have a museum at the office where you have your failures, your failed IDs? Not as a warning, more like a celebration. Well, at the time that seemed like a good idea, it turned out not to, but good for us, we tried. And the next try was a big success. I think there it takes many tries to achieve success. Ten years ago, I wrote an article called Shunk Cloud Computing. I think this is the worst named ID I've ever had. But anyway, it was very much about using the bounded context of domain-driven design for organizing software and organizing teams. Because to be really productive in a team, you need to be protected from the other teams. That was the idea. So I think this is, uh, yeah, it was before uh, microservices was a name, but when they wrote that article, they quoted this uh, art article. And uh, I, so to me, this is kind of like proof that microservices wasn't created by technical reasons. It was created for uh, organizational reasons. You don't have to believe that, but uh, this is a heated debate. I know that. Some uh, believe the wrong things here. It's all about this. It's all about this. Okay, so we have this bridge. And uh, what we will ha um, see now, no, it's not that just us going over to the product manager and the security people and so on and so forth. They will come to us as well. We are going f f both directions here, of course. So question now is, we have this great collaboration situation. What will we use it for? And I propose the following. Let's focus on solving bottlenecks. In domain-driven design terms, that might be to, or, or, or is also that you should focus on the core domain. Don't try to solve all the problems in a company by writing software for it. it it's probably a great idea to buy stuff. Word is quite good at uh, word processing, for example. Don't, don't build a new one of those. But uh, your competitive edge, where, what is your di differentiator compared to your competitors? There you should put your money. That's look for bottlenecks there. It might be considered uh, a bottleneck to that the developers are typing too slow. And uh, well, yeah, it, it could be seen like that. So, so uh, I often, uh, joke about who's the fastest developer. Well, if, if the, the needed development is very much like repetitive, a program is faster than any of you in here. Don't feel offended now, that's just how it is. You shouldn't be used for repetitive things. Use automation instead. On the other hand, people are still better at many things than programs and computers. We should focus on uh, the relationship part. Maybe some of you really love your computer, but it's nicer to hang out with the people, don't you think? Uh, really hard. Uh, so relationships uh, being creative, we are great at that. Computers aren't yet. Let's see what happens, but for now this is true. On the other hand, automation shall take care of the rest. So we are, it's not about uh, kicking people, not at all. People should do the right stuff they will be more happy when doing it also. So this is only positive. Finally, working with the bottlenecks. I often see a certain mistake being done. I'm trying to show a bottleneck here. I hope that makes sense. So we put in power at one end of this flow, but uh, there is a bottleneck, so there can only go out one at a time of those, whatever it is, products. But then, I sound like I'm, I'm uh, whining now, but, but quite often people think, why don't we add to the power at the, at the left here? Would that be a good idea? No, of course not. not. The outcome isn't changed at all. The only thing that now happened was probably what we did at the left now cost a lot more, and we are creating a queue. And that queue also costs money. So this is a really bad idea. Unfortunately, it's not going to help adding power at the right either. There is not much more, there, there is not more coming out. 
I think developer has an automatic uh, understanding of this. This is obvious to you. You have been doing optimization for a long time and you know it's not helping you to delete comments everywhere. The program is not going faster. You should find a tight loop, optimize there, and all of a sudden it makes a big change. So that's, you don't, don't have to optimize everything. You should find the right place. The right place is the bottleneck. Why is the, this mistake being done all the time? I think uh, I often hear those comments. Well, let's uh, help, uh, let's do this initiative because it affects a lot of people. Well, <laughs> that's nice. It's not helping your business at all. Not at all. Or Google is doing it. Oh, don't go there. Google is doing a lot of good stuff, but really bad things as well. I had a friend who worked for Google, and he, uh, 10 years afterwards, uh, when I uh, meet him, he says, do you know I left Google? And I think, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's like seven years ago. But he, he, he didn't really think they were the, the optimal place either. Of course not. There are pros and cons. No, we are not following a vendor and do what they are doing. Of course not. Might help us. It might be the opposite. Or we should not either do what, what the people are screaming about the most. We should try to found, find the bottlenecks and solve them. Because this is a situation where we can spend x and we get the benefit of 10 times as much or or more so this is what we should be doing over that bridge run over that to try to find the bottlenecks and solve them okay what really matters then five ideas start with the purpose the business is the context focus on language use the circle of safety and solve bottlenecks i think those things really matters and ddd were everywhere here a little bit hidden for those of you who haven't studied yet, uh, used it, obvious to others of you, I think. So what happened now, those four situations I talked about in the beginning, they are very much evolved now, and they are happy. All of a sudden, they were quite uh, not so happy in the beginning. Now they are happy, and they are involved in creating the outcome, doing valuable stuff. <coughs> what a change. So. I have this dream. What if what we just talked about could be the normal that's being used everywhere and all the time? I think that would be really, really amazing. So it's actually time for uh, yeah, action now, call for action. And th that call for action is that we should be our dream. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>